Welcome to the Med Fitness Seminar. I'm Richard Wolf, president of Med Fitness. We are a strength training studio located in St. Charles. If you want help getting stronger and healthier, visit medfitnessprogram.com. Our topic tonight is answers to big questions about protein. We have four good questions. We're gonna jump right in on question number one. My doctor tells me that Americans get more protein than they need. Should I be concerned about still paying attention to how much protein I eat? This is a good question because doctors often give health and nutrition advice as part of their practice, and so let's break this down. We look at the first layer of assessing whether your doctor's right or not. They are right because if we look at the standard measure for assessing protein adequacy in the United States, it's been the recommended dietary allowance or otherwise known as the RDA. And so we look at that assessment, the average American does eat more than the RDA. In fact, the average adult is consuming about 90 grams of protein each day. Men eat a little more than women. And so on that threshold, the average American is consuming more than the RDA. However, the footnote to that, and it's an important footnote, is that the RDA is not set as a recommended intake for an aging population trying to rebuild muscle and gain strength. So let's take a deeper dive on this for a second. Take the average 130 pound woman. If you do the math on 90 grams a day, they may get enough protein to optimize the muscle building process. What they'll need to do to achieve that is to have consistent intake of that 90 grams throughout the day. In other words, they gotta take that 90 and split it into four feedings, whether it's meals or snacks. If they distribute it across the day that way, the 90 is about enough for a 130 pound woman to optimize the muscle building process if they're strength training. But if you go above someone over 130 pounds, then of course those numbers don't work. So obviously that is the overwhelming majority of adults in the United States who 90 grams is not gonna be enough to optimize the muscle building process. You may recall that evidence-based guideline that we gave last month, which was 0.18 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So we call this know your number. Everyone should know their number. What is the level of protein per meal where muscle building is optimized for you? And so for me at 185 pounds, it's 33 grams. If I do that math, body weight times 0.18, I get 33. So as I'm eating protein at a meal, as I go up to 33 grams, that muscle building process is climbing. If I go past 33, it's leveling out. So it's not the end of the world if I consume more than 33 grams, but I can't expect it to keep building more and more muscle. So that's my number, 33. You should know your number. And the other side of this is that we know that outcomes are optimized when we distribute our protein throughout the day versus clump it into one big meal. Scientists observed what they describe as a skewed eating pattern for most older adults, meaning they'll have a meal, it'll be adequate in protein, but then they'll have a meal, it'll have little to no protein. So they're not consistent with protein throughout their day. So if you're strength training and you wanna get the most out of your strength workouts, you will get the biggest strength gain and muscle gain, you wanna take your number and times it by four, or I should say distribute it four times over the day, whether it's a meal and or a snack, three meals, one snack, two meals, two snacks, however it makes sense for you, but the RDA is not gonna get the average adult there if they weigh more than 130 pounds. So in one sense, your doctor's correct, but when we look at the big picture, there are many cases where those numbers don't work and you gotta look to that 0.18 grams per meal, which is to, again, know your number per your meal. So that's question number one. Number two is, I'm a vegetarian. Can I still build muscle if I'm not eating meat, fish, and poultry? This is a good question because more and more people are interested in plant-based and, and plant-exclusive diet these days. And so the quick answer is yes. You can build muscle if you're vegetarian. You can build muscle if you never eat animal products. And the reason for this is that your body is essentially agnostic when it comes to protein. That just means that all it knows is whether or not the foods it's consuming provide amino acids. If those amino acids are there and they're there in sufficient quantities, 
your body doesn't care where it came from. 20 grams of plant protein is processed in a very similar way as 20 grams of animal protein. So we can build muscle and get stronger on a variety of foods here. But what I'd like to do is lay some context here. Many of you are familiar with the fact that historically, both you know, medical professionals, nutrition professionals, consumers, a lot of people, fitness professionals, we've tended to refer to animal protein as high quality and plant protein as low quality. Now, there's some good reasons why we've made that distinction. One is that the amino acid profile of animal products is more favorable than plants. In other words, there's more amounts, higher quantities of the essential amino acids in animal proteins than typically in plant proteins. So that is one reason why we would say, hey, animal protein is high quality. The other has to do with the digestibility of those proteins. Animal proteins score higher on digestibility assessment. So these are good reasons why we would sort of put these protein sources in two different boxes. However, we need to, again, step back again and look at the big pictures. That assessment has been based on short-term studies where we're just looking at what kind of an effect protein has on anabolic processes. So in other words, if you eat 20 grams of protein, does your body sort of upregulate the muscle protein synthesis process? We know that does happen short-term when I have animal proteins. And does the same thing happen when I have plant proteins? Yes, it does, but to a smaller magnitude. So we can still argue that animal protein is higher quality. However, a new point to this conversation is that with more interest in plant-based diets, we now have scientists taking a much closer look at this issue of matched diets. In other words, if I look at 10 vegetarians and compare them to 10 omnivores, people that are eating plants and and animal protein, the omnivores are usually gonna be eating more protein. Why is that? Because animal protein is simply more concentrated. I'll give you an example. If you wanted to get 14 grams of protein from plants, if you were gonna get beans, let's say, beans are a good source of plant protein. If you had a cup of beans, you're gonna consume about 250 calories from a cup of beans to get 14 grams of protein versus two ounces of fish, I can get 14 grams of protein for about 50 calories. And so not only is the fish lower in calories to get that same protein equivalent, but it's a smaller amount of food. Two ounces is much easier to eat for the average adult than a cup of a high fiber food like a cup of beans. I'm not arguing against beans, I'm just saying that if you took a 70 year old and said, eat a cup of beans or have two ounces of fish, it's a lot easier for them to eat two ounces of fish usually than it is to have a full cup of a fiber rich food like beans. So my point being that the animal foods are just a more concentrated source of the protein that we're looking for. And so what's been argued in recent years is to sort of reassess how we describe these as low and high quality. You can get high quality protein from plant sources, you can get high quality proteins from animal, but a, a simple sort of practical way to think of it is that animal protein tends to be more concentrated than plant-based proteins. Now, let's give you an example of a recent study tackling this issue of these different protein types relative to strength training. We know interest in strength training is growing, interest in plant-based eating is growing. So what scientists have done in recent years is begin to do studies where people are strength training and they've give them what's called matched diets, where they give the same amount of plant protein, the same amount of animal protein, and they see what happens. A recent study published just a few months ago did just this, it was in the Journal of Sports Medicine, and they took adult men between the ages of 30, 20 and 30, who were strength trained. This was a 12-week study. They were strength training twice a week, full body workouts, supervised workouts, and measured muscle protein synthesis, looked at increases in muscle tissue, cross-sectional area, as well as strength gains. And surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, what they discovered is that when they use this 1.6 grams of protein per pound recommendation, per kilogram, I'm sorry, they used a 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram intake, which by the way, without getting too technical here, that translates into the same recommendation I made just a moment ago. Our number, we keep it simpler. We say 
0.18 grams per pound. It's easy to calculate, it's a per meal number. These scientists gave these uh, uh, men 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So when you do all the math on that, I'm not gonna break it down for you, it comes out to the same number. So they're eating uh, an, an intake that was basically double the RDA. So what they found at these 12 weeks is that there was essentially no difference. The adult men who were strength training twice a week, engaging in intense full body strength workouts, gained the same strength gains on the plant protein as they did the animal protein. They had the same increase in cross-sectional area, which is muscle size on the plant-based as well versus the animal-based. So this is good news for those of us who like to mix in some plant proteins into our diet, uh, or for those who are vegans who are only eating plants and are still trying to build muscle and get strong. So the answer here is yes and yes. You can build muscle if you're a vegetarian and if you're an omnivore, which means you're having animal protein and plant protein, that plant protein can play an equally important role in the muscle building process. Good question though. Number three is, have we become obsessed with protein in the United States? It seems like that's all we talk about. Well, I can concur with this. It does seem like everyone is talking about protein all the time. However, there are two reasons why we should be elevating our conversation around protein here in America. And the first reason is that we live in an aging society. Of course, everyone ages as they get older, but uh, the average age in the United States is climbing. And right now, the average age is about 40. And so we know that's the point in an individual's life cycle where we start to experience sarcopenia. We start to lose muscle. And as we get close to 50, we start to develop this anabolic resistance, which is this reduce sensitivity to protein and skeletal muscle and from a nutrition and absorptive standpoint. So two reasons there why we actually need more protein as we age. This is not always the case with nutrients. And the older we get, some nutrients we should consume less of. Some, our need goes up a little bit. Protein is one of them. And so we're living in an aging society. So we should be cognizant. We should be paying attention to adequate protein in our diet. The second reason is that we don't use our muscles the way we used to. We have what scientists refer to as disuse atrophy. We've all heard about the sitting phenomenon in the United States. We sit on our way to work. We commute for half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, sitting on the train, driving in the car. We go to the office. We're on a computer all day long. We're sitting for hours and hours and hours. And then we drive home for another couple hours, sitting again. We sit down and have dinner and then we sit and watch TV and we sleep overnight and then it all happens again. So we have an abundance of inactivity in the United States. And some of us has been just our own choice as well as advancements in technology to where we no longer have to move our body. I can remember growing up cutting the grass with a a non-motorized lawnmower and pushing it, a push mower, and spending pretty significant energy mowing the lawn. Well, today, of course, not only do few people even mow their own lawn, they pay a service who they don't have to lift a finger, but those who do often have riding lawn mowers and or just electric or back gas-powered mowers that are super easy and efficient. And so there are many examples of where the energy and calories we used to spend has contracted and decreased significantly year after year to where just one generation later, we're burning significantly fewer calories day to day through formal and informal physical activity than we did previously. It was 20 years ago when Harvard University sponsored a conference about the connection between cancer and exercise. And, and they coined the phrase, which has been often referred to back then, is sedentary exerciser. That's someone who goes to the fitness center, does a 30 minute exercise session, comes home and basically does nothing for the rest of the week. So we've seen this sort of insidious trend of less formal and less informal exercise and that simply accelerates muscle loss. And this disuse atrophy becomes more and more prominent in a culture where we're sitting for hours a day. So for those two reasons, one, we're aging, the average age is going up, protein, uh, anabolic resistance is developing and we're not using our muscles so we're not doing anything to maintain them and most adults of course the the kicker is that most adults aren't strength training so they're not stimulating their muscular system 
to preserve lean mass. So we should be attentive to protein and adequate intakes in our diet. As much as it might seem like we're obsessed with it, uh, most people would benefit by modifying what they're doing and optimizing their protein pattern on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's number three. And number four is, what should I look for in a protein supplement? If I'm gonna choose to use one as a tool in my diet to help me get up to these thresholds, what should I be looking for? Three very simple take-home messages here. One is that look for protein. And by that I mean when you look at supplements, it's easy to get bogged down with supplements that have dozens of ingredients unrelated to what you're looking for. And so when you're looking for a protein supplement, look for just protein and look for a serving dose of at least 20 to 30 grams. If it's a little above that, that's okay. But 20 to 30 grams, when we look at the studies that have been evaluating protein in the last decade or so, all find that to be a anabolic dose of protein. We can upregulate that muscle protein synthesis with 20 to 30 grams in most adults and begin to drive up muscle protein synthesis. So look for at least 20 to 30 grams per serving when you're choosing a protein supplement. The second one is to choose a protein powder. It used to be that what was popular was capsules as well as tablets. Those are less popular these days. They still do exist. I would go with the straight powder because it costs less than tablets or capsules. And it's also more versatile. Of course, the, the most common way to use that powder is to make a protein shake and add fruits or vegetables and other things and blend up a nice tasty shake, which many people do. But then you can also take that powder and mix it into other foods if you want. If you don't want to make a shake, you can be versatile here and you can add it to a variety of different foods. So it can be used in a variety of ways. So look for a protein powder if you're using a supplement. Does that mean that nutrition bars that give protein should be excluded? No. If that's convenient for you, then that's okay too. That can be a protein snack or even the protein drinks like muscle milk uh, are okay as well. So it's really about finding one that is convenient and simple and easy to use for you. But I wouldn't spend money on protein in tablets or capsule form. And lastly, I would skip the extras. What I mean by this is what supplement manufacturers do these days is they create what they call a stack. A stack is simply a product that has multiple ingredients in it that are supposed to work synergistically and or to support the same outcome. So when you think about building muscle, yes, protein is the nutrient that we need, but then we think about creatine monohydrate as well as hydroxymethylbutyrate, HMB. These are two popular compounds that are touted for muscle building effects. So I'll say two things here. One, there's no direct effect on muscle protein synthesis from creatine monohydrate. As you know from listening to me in the past, it does improve the energy dynamics of skeletal muscle. So if you were doing a really long strength workout, if you're training for an hour and a half doing set after set after set of the same exercise, then there may be some benefit to the creatine, but in a context where you're doing a full body, high intensity strength workout, one set per exercise, then moving to a different exercise, there's no application for creatine because you're shifting to a different muscle group. So here, Longer isn't better. You want a short workout that's super hard and, and super brief. And so I wouldn't bother with creatine. The HMB I also wouldn't bother with. That is a metabolite of the essential amino acid leucine, which we know plays a critical role in muscle protein synthesis. But the HMB is no more anabolic than the leucine is. So if you're getting a whole protein, whether it's plant or animal, and you're getting 20 or 30 grams of protein, the leucine is in there. And so you don't need to then take something on top of it to bump up muscle protein synthesis. So as long as you're getting adequate protein, as we've just reviewed, at those thresholds, you're okay. You don't need to spend money on HMB or creatine. So you can save money and keep it simple at the same time. Thanks for watching tonight, guys. I hope that's helpful. If you want to re-watch this video and or share this video with someone that you know who's trying to build muscle, you can go to medfitnessprogram.com, click on our Learning Center, and you'll see the video there. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.